Again, I cannot account to you what a great honor it is to have Brother Donald Knight to come and preach to us. He's preached here before, but it's probably been at least 15 years ago. So uh, we're glad you're coming back to Albany. The man goes to Lesotho. And again, he's been to over 150 countries. He will be led of the Holy Ghost. And your life and my life, we will be impacted through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's give him a good Albany New Life welcome. Thank you, Pastor. Let me say it's a privilege to be with you today and to worship the Lord. Um, you can be seated. Let's just do things a little different. I'm trying to be led by the Holy Ghost anyway, so you can just be seated. I do want to say that I am very, very impressed. And I am very pleased and very thankful that uh, the way this service has been conducted, and especially some of the things that were done. I'm afraid that as time progresses and the apostolic movement and our organization adds years to its initial beginnings, we have more and more a tendency to become more regimented in what we do in church. And I have uh, I've been in many churches. Um, yes, I've been privileged to travel all over the world. Many countries that I've been in, I've been in several times in that country. And uh, I've I've been in all 50 states and most of the Canadian provinces, and uh, I've been in a lot of churches. And I am very, very concerned that we continually be in, are being influenced by what goes on in the denominational world. And we can do things, we can do things out of patterns and form <coughs> instead of doing it in relation to the Spirit. Amen. And that's why I appreciate what has been happening here. It's refreshing to me. Now, that's not trying to put down any other place. If you've ever been in Stone Mountain, you know that place is... We don't have a whole lot of formalities either. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord is very, very good. All right. Okay. Let me just kind of try to relax here a moment and, and uh, get my composure. I've been thinking at different times I'd wake up during the night and I'd think about this service and this message. <laughs> thought about what I said last night and probably shouldn't have said some of those things. And then uh, all this morning, I have, I, my mind has been on this message. Let me share with you one thing. I am not here to try to preach a great message. All right? I'm not here, and it is not my purpose to preach a message that you will walk out the door and say, man, that's a great preacher. There's something wrong with it when we walk out the door praising the preaching and instead of walking out the door and saying, wasn't it a great God in our midst? And didn't God do the work in our midst? I feel that. And so <clears throat> I also recognize another need, and that is that uh, in, in our churches, I'm seeing so many things develop and happen. Excuse me for taking a few minutes, but 
I've just got to because I've got to lay a foundation. I want you to know where I'm coming from. All right? And that is, uh, I, I, I see that churches are having all kinds of problems. There are things going on in our churches that should not be going on. There are people that are frustrated. There are people many times that have been in the church for even years that are discouraged. They don't seem to know. They, they go to church and try to get a good feeling. And let me point out to you, something is wrong if you have to live from a bounce every Sunday to the next Sunday. Amen. There's something wrong there. And so I have been able to determine, as I mentioned last night, I'm going to share with you and the things that I say to you and proclaim to you I'm going to back it up with my own personal experiences and I'm going to open some things up to you. And it may be that somewhere along in this message, I may have to make a confession or two. And I'm not afraid to do that. And I may not do that. But I've confessed some things. that When I've said that, you know, sometimes in messages of sleeping, people all of a sudden wake up and they say, he's going to confess some things. Uh, I'm not afraid to do that. And, uh, and, and because I found a remedy. And so what I intend to do is today in this message, I intend to give you something that if you will take it to heart and put it into practice, I'm not talking about something that you put in practice at church. I'm talking about Monday through Saturday out there. Amen. And if you will begin to put this thing, and this is the first thing, and this is the overwhelming thing, and I'm going to share with you how that when I put this in practice, and I will tell you some things that has happened to me because I put, what I'm about to tell you to put in practice. I told you last night, I will not preach something to you and tell you what you ought to do that I haven't already first done myself and put in practice myself and found out that it changed. It changed me, It's cha and it will change anyone else and every one of you. Now, I've enjoyed this service, and it's been, it's been great and good. But you see... If you can have an effect that will change you personally. Come on, you haven't reached the highest level yet. We haven't attained yet. We haven't got there where we ought to get yet. None of us can say, I've arrived yet. We can't do that. But there's nothing to keep us from getting to the next level or the next plateau, or the next uh, element, or the next experience, or the next position, or the next place, or the next relationship with God. There's nothing to keep any one of us from getting to the next level. And if you're interested only in staying where you are, something's wrong with your Holy Ghost. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly. Uh, some of you started clamping down on me a little bit. Oh, I know what I need to do. Just remind you. I know what's wrong. I need to put my glasses on. The reason I put my glasses on is because you folks look hazy and fuzzy out there without the glasses. But when I put my glasses on, I can see your face clearly. And I want to see your countenance and I want to see your reaction while I'm trying to share the word of God. Because I'm not afraid of your looks. <laughs> I've been at it too long. And so, every one of us, I am sure, if we're going to walk with God and we are serious about it, we want to be able to have more victories over the enemy and over the condition and the circumstances of life than we've ever had before. The devil doesn't have to have victory over us. We've got victory over him. We don't have to get discouraged because life throws us a curve. In fact, throws us a lot of curves all the time. Life throws. Man's days are few and full of trouble. We all have our troubles and we all have.
have our battles, and we all have our struggles. And so, before I even read to you my scripture and tell you uh, uh, what it is that uh, that I, I want to point out to you that you need to put this in practice. This is a foundation. I've already put it in practice, already found it works. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes some things. I'm talking about some physical things. I'm not talking about some things where we're talking about hearing voices, and I may talk about hearing the voice of the Lord. But I'm going to talk about some physical things that God got my attention with and caused me to stop and Ask, what are you trying to say to me? And then he started speaking to me specifically about the things that I needed to be doing. All right. Uh, I, I've been on a six and a half year journey that uh, I, I've never, never in my entire life. I've never had so many unusual and unbelievable experiences. Um, I've, uh, I, I've, I've never seen things with my eyes that, that I ha had just never in my life seen before, heard about things. I've never had some personal, spiritual experiences uh, that uh, affected even physically like I've had in the last six and a half years. I I'm trying to go. <laughs> I'm just trying to go. <laughs> Amen. Uh, oh, you didn't mean go eat, did you? No. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, I, I had to make sure that he just wasn't ready to leave the house. <laughs> Amen. All right. Praise God. Because um, uh, most of you probably don't know this. I mentioned last night the most traumatic experience I ever had was that Sister Knight and I was on one of our frequent mission trips. Um, we had gone to a third world country in Africa. Third world. We had uh, <clears throat> made the trip well. The amazing thing was that Sister Knight begin to have problems and, and difficulties at times with swelling, retention of fluids. In fact, she was taking a continual medication for that to try to keep the fluids down because she also had a blood condition that fluids was not going to, to help the situation or the build up in, in, in the body cells. And uh, the strange thing is we, we, we would get ready to go on a trip, and it just seemed like, and she remarked at different times, it just seemed like that, uh, that just getting near taking the trip and the knowledge, it would trigger something in her body that she would have one of those outburst situations where her body really started retaining fluid. And most of the time, in fact, every time on the long plane flights, it didn't help it, it'd get worse. And she would wind up somewhere on a mission field, uh, just really bloated and not feeling well and so forth. And on this trip, six and a half years ago, uh, she was having an unusually severe attack. Of, uh, of whatever this situation was of retaining fluids. Let me get down here and just kind of walk around a little bit. Is this okay? Yeah, I, you don't have to worry. Don't be afraid. I don't bite. So don't worry. But I just like to feel like getting close to the people that I'm trying to minister to and to help. I want you to know that. I don't feel like I'm any better than any of you. Don't stand up here and feel like to look. I, I'm trying to save myself and I'm trying to help other folks. So that's, that's it. And so on this trip, she goes on this trip and she is in terrible shape and miserable and so forth. The unbelievable thing happened that on that trip, never happened before, never happened before, her body 
begin to adjust itself and the further we got in the trip, the more her swelling began to go down. Mind you, on airplanes for hours at a time and it's going down. When we get to this third world country in Africa, the swelling is almost, if not completely gone, almost gone. Okay. So we, we get there on a Friday night. We fellowship with the missionaries in their room, and we get in the room. The next day, we're going to start a journey throughout the French-speaking part of the country. The country we were in was a dual language, English, which was the minority but had a section of the country is English. Most of it was French speaking. The church over the years was in the English speaking. But God had already spoken just a handful of years before and said the future of the United Pentecostal Church is in the French speaking part of this nation. And we were going with the missionary. First trip to go through the French speaking part. And they had just a, a few appointments. We didn't even know what kind of churches that we were going to be in. But we were going to explore out the land, so to speak. And uh, then consider, and missionary was going to make there. By the way, today there are churches in the United Pentecostal Church in the French-speaking part of the country. And thank God, I reason... The reason that I'm so rejoicing about that is because I've been there. I've been there three or four times. I've preached in churches on that side, French-speaking churches. Amen. Thank God. I feel so good about it. I can rejoice about it. And thank God for that trip. Amen. The next morning, we go down and we have breakfast together. Sister Knight's feeling good. Everything's going fine. You know, swelling is gone, unreal. She eats a hearty breakfast. We're all eating well. And then we're going to load up and we're headed out on that trip. Well, <laughs> uh, things begin to take an unusual turn. Missionary asked me, would I go in town? He'd like for me to go in town. Both he and his wife were going. They're going to pick up a few things. He needed to do something, and he wanted me to go with him. And so about 10 o'clock in the morning, we load up and leave. That's the missionary, his wife, and I. And we're going two hours. Let me shorten it down. Two hours. I leave the wife in the room. And she's exercising. You know, she's got one of those CDs, Walk Away the Pounds, or whatever that name of it is, you know. And, and uh, she's, she's exercising. But she makes a statement just before I leave, and she has, says, I have a ferocious headache. And uh, she's exercising. I mean, she's, she's, she's doing the whatever it is. And she's doing that, you know. She said, I've got a ferocious headache. And I asked her, please, stop. You don't need to do that. I kept talking to her. Kept saying something to her about it. I was about ready to go out the door. And I'm standing near the door, looking across the room. And I'm pleading with her, stop, stop. You don't need to know. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. See, the reason was that she had done that before, and when she was doing that before and after she had done it several weeks, she would do so much better physically. But you know how many of us are? We slacked off. And she had slacked off and was running into some problems. And so she was going to pick it up again because she knew that it would help her. And I'm pleading with her, and she's refusing. Now, I'm not, not angry, but I'm a little aggravated and... Uh, can I confess something to you? Go ahead. 
I didn't know I was going to confess anything in this message, but here I am. Um, I, I, I got aggravated. I wasn't angry. I didn't say anything, hard or harsh. But normally, under, under every normal circumstance, I don't know how it got started. I don't know how it started, but over the years. If I was going to go out and go to the grocery store and get something, before I'd go out the door, you know, and even though I'm going to be back in 30 minutes or 45 minutes or what have you, we just kind of do a little pecky, pecky like kissy. You know what I'm talking about? You know, not, not any of those, kind, none of those kind, just that little, you know, and then I'd walk out the door. It was just, you know, I, I don't know how I got started. What are all you grinning about? I, I see some of the sisters looking to the husbands. I know what you're thinking. Why don't you do something like that? <laughs> okay. Oh, so much for that. <laughs> but anyway, and so um, I, I was aggravated enough. Came very close to turning around and walking out the door because I was aggravated. But to this day, I am so thankful. that I didn't walk out the door. But I walked over, even though I was aggravated. And I told her several times, I, I wish you wouldn't stop. You don't need to do that. You're not feeling well. You don't need to do that. But I am so thankful till this day that I went across that room and gave her that little, that little, you know, little, little pecky kid walked out the door because when I returned to that room and I didn't have a key there was only one key to that room she never answered the door we had to break into the room she was on the bed Missionary was well versed in being able to do CPR and what have you. He worked hard. He worked for 20, 25 minutes hard, hard, perspiring, trying, trying to get a pulse and what have you to no avail. I put in practice the one thing and didn't even recognize it that I had learned a few years before that because somebody had preached on it and I didn't even know. Didn't even know it was in the scripture. But I heard a missionary's wife story about her husband. Wasn't expected to live from a terrible automobile accident in Africa. And how she said, the Bible says, in everything give thanks. This is pleasing to God. And so she began the testimony. How? They're saying he's not going to live. And she's in, in the United States saying, I thank you, God. My husband's been in an accident and he's not going to live. Next word. And it kept on progressing until finally they said, well, it looks like he's going to live, but he's going to be a vegetable. And she started thanking God. Well, he thank God he's going to live and be a vegetable. And she's thanking God. Then the next message, he's not going to be a vegetable, but he's going to be paralyzed, paralyzed, and what have you. And so she said, I thank God for that. And then the word came back. Well, he's not going to be completely paralyzed. He's probably not going to have some use of something. And she's going through the routine. Until finally, the man was completely whole and well. Amen. And so what I'm trying to say to you, what I'm trying to share with you, and this is the reason, because I have led into this, and that is ever since that, several years ago, I tried to put that personally into practice myself, to give thanks for everything, and everything give thanks. Hey, life is not easy, and we're all ready and willing to say, Lord, thank you because you blessed me. 
But the problem is we want to complain whenever things go wrong. But the Bible gives us a pattern. If you want to have a massive change in your life, let me tell you, if you will start thanking God in everything, I mean in the good times, thank God. In the bad times, thank God. In the times when everything's going horrible, thank God. Thank God when you're in pain. Thank God when a loved one is in death's door. Thank God whenever your body is in a mess. Thank God in everything give thanks. It's pleasing to God. transpired. I just know when I got in that room, I'm hit with a mammoth condition just out of nowhere. Unexpected. Completely. I didn't know what to do, but guess what? One year later, I'm back in the same country. We're going to make that trip. And I made that trip with the missionaries through French-speaking Africa. Amen. I haven't stayed in that same place. We've driven right past it. And I'm, I looked over and I looked back and I said, well, that's the place. But you see, I've learned this. I'm not afraid. Not afraid. Not afraid to give God praise. To thank him for everything. The missionary's wife only told me a couple of years ago. I was in the home. I was there for another conference. And she said, I will never forget what you said standing at the foot of her bed. I had no idea what I said. It was traumatic what I was going through. I knew CPR was not going to bring her back. She's gone. She's dead. We're in a third world country. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? I'm just when he was working, I stood at that foot of the bed. I watched everything he was doing. When finally he finished, and I realized my last hope was just gone. The hope of still having that woman that we'd been together 56 years. And I didn't even know what I said. I had to ask her. I said, what did I say? And this is what she said. She said, you said, the Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. How is it I could do that without even being aware of what I had done? Because I had been practicing for several years. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Give thanks in the good times. Give thanks in the bad times. Give thanks in the painful times. Give thanks when you don't know what to do. Give thanks when you don't know where you're going. Give thanks whenever you don't even know if your needs are going to be taken care of. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Be thankful in everything. In everything. And so, and so as a result, I knew for a fact I was on the right track. Let me tell you what happens when you give thanks in everything. You change your attitude. You change your mental outlook. You change your perception of things. You change your own well-being and your own self. You become a different person. I understand. I 
I understand. I'm pushing you over in some territory here. And you, you don't understand. Except when you put these things in place, you radicalize your relationship with God. Because now you've got a connection you've never had before. Now you've got something that you can hold on to that you couldn't hold on to before. The bad times aren't nearly as bad when you give him thanks. The painful times aren't nearly as painful when you give him thanks. The disappointments and the rejections are not nearly so hard and harsh when you give him thanks. It changes you as an individual. It makes a difference. And when it changes you, automatically, it changes new life of Albany. Because when you walk in, you don't have to walk in looking for a blessing. Preacher, preach something to me that will make me feel better about my condition. You don't have to worry about whether he's missing what you need or not. Because if you've already had this kind of change, what you do have going on in your life is you are a changed person. And when you walk into the house of God, you're not walking in with a need. Recently I was in a church and somebody asked, asked this question, how many came for a blessing? I happened to be sitting toward the front over in the corner and I looked all through the congregation, hands up all over the place. Folks, Looking for a blessing. Came to church for a blessing. Uh, guess what? I never put my hand up. I didn't come to church to get a blessing. Let's go. Come on. Come on. You say, Whoa, what's wrong with you? Come on. I can kind of feel that spirit a little bit somewhere out here. Something wrong with you. You're gonna, you say, you don't come to church to get a blessing? No, I don't. I come to church to be a blessing. If I can be one. And why? I'll tell you why. Because before I ever got to church, I got my blessing. All week long, I've had my blessings. All week long. It doesn't matter what the condition. I've had my blessing. I've had my blessing. Now I'm going to come to church and share my blessing with somebody else that may be in trouble and may be struggling. So anyway, Lord, I didn't intend to go that long. But we, we've been here a while, so if it takes me a while, are you going to stay with me? Or not? Amen. Are you going to keep telling me, let's go, let's go, let's go? Oh, okay, just wanting to check on you. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Well, in the past six and a half years, as I said, I've experienced things. I've learned things. I've seen things. I've had physical experiences. I'm going to tell you about one that this is probably going to surprise you. I'm going to tell you about something. Uh, a, a literal physical thing has had one of the big impacts and changed my life. And we'll talk about it in just a few minutes. Unless we go... Praise God. That's no, okay. I can't help it. I'm sorry. I, I only pick on folks I like, and I like you. Know that. Amen. Amen. 
So, after this event and all of the things that go along with it, now my life is radically different, obviously. And uh, I think what I was doing was I was trying to maybe drown my sorrow with food. And I started gaining weight, just almost immediately. And the reason I knew I was gaining weight is because my clothes kept felt like they were shrinking. <laughs> and they were getting tired. And I got on the scale out of curiosity. Well, I knew that, but, okay, most people wouldn't confess this. I'm going to confess this. The thing that really shook me up was after I took a shower one day. Okay, I know. I, 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 I heard that giggle, even though she was trying to conceal it. I heard that giggle. Yes, ma'am, you're right. I got out of the shower, and in, in, in the master bath is one of those big, long mirrors. You know, uh-oh. And I was just finished toweling off. I know this is sensitive, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And I happened to look up in the mirror, and it, I either said it out loud, if I didn't, it was absolutely in my innermost being. I happened to see the results of my clothes shrinking. <laughs> and this is what I said. That is ugly. And I made up my mind I was going to do something about it. Now, I'm an old man. I can't run. You know, I've, I've tried it. And my, my joints just won't take it. And I've even tried the job on days when I felt like, oh, I feel 20 years younger. And tried the job. And I jog about two steps and realize I can't do that either. But there's one thing I can do. I can walk. And so I started a walking regimen. Now there happens to be something about this. The reason I'm telling you this is because God knows me. Just like he knows you. I think God tries to talk to us a whole lot of times, in fact, on a very regular basis, and we're too busy, too caught up in too many things, and we don't hear a thing, and we miss it. And can I point out one other thing to you? You never know what you're missing, because you only live life one time, one way. You never know what could have been, or what should have been. That's like the enemy tells folks, folks come to church, oh, you don't, you don't want to worry about that Holy Ghost, you, know, you can handle things and what have you. And because you've never experienced what it's like to have a born-again experience, you just pass it off as if it's just another option. Well, my friend, if once you experience the power of the Holy Ghost in your life and the Spirit of God working in your life, you will say like so many others have said, if I would have known it was this good, I would have gotten it long ago. But you only live through life one time, one way. You never know what you need. But I could walk. And so I started walking. Now, there's two sides to my subdivision. 
One is called the Arbor's side, and the side I live in is the Terrace side. And uh, there's only one street to go into the Arbor's off of Terra, and there's only one way to get in the entire subdivision from the outside, and that's come on to Terra Boulevard, which I happen to live on. And then there are cul-de-sacs on both sides. And so I started walking both sides. At first, uh, it was a struggle, and but it didn't take long. The body adjusts. And so for probably four years or better, I have, uh, I, I, I have regularly walked the entire subdivision every day, except I don't do it Sundays anymore because it conflicts with church. I used to do it Sunday until I realized I want to dedicate my mind to what I'm going to be about. And so I walk all the cul-de-sacs. I took the car to find out how far it is. It's five and a half miles. And so I walk. Amen. I walk five and a half, five and a half miles. And uh, uh, approximately. And guess what happened? Amazing thing began to happen. My clothes begin to get bigger. And I, I found out that in a matter of a short period of time, and basically I've been able to keep it off, I shed 30 pounds. 30 pounds. That's good. I'll tell you why. Because part of what I saw was an old man's pot belly. Come on now. Some of you getting quiet. Men have a problem with stomach. And this has been the most evil thing because it keeps trying to cling onto me when I keep trying to do everything to rebuke it and kill it. And I've gotten this far and it seems like we're in a stalemate, but I'm still doing that walking. But you see, God knew something about me. I'm getting to it. All right, just taking me a little time. It's dangerous. When I get to feeling an unction, I slow down and get more delivered. Are you with me? Amen. Don't worry about pot roast. The Lord will take care of that. Amen. And don't worry about having to beat the Baptist to the restaurant. It's better if you go later. There's less people there and you can walk right in. Amen. I'm trying to do you a favor, folks. <laughs> all right, all right. But you see, the Lord knew me. <clears throat> and he knew how to bring me to a place so he could do something unusual, unbelievable, to bring me the assurance and, the rem and reminding me I told you what I wanted you to do, and I gave you promises. And he knew me, and he knew how he could do something unusual, and that I would eventually recognize it and say, okay, Lord, so I'm going to tell you. While I'm walking, well, whether I'm walking or not, I, I have another Bad situation about me. Really bad. Really bad. Really bad. I am a pack rat. Nobody, the rest of you don't know what pack rat means? You know what it means? Yeah, that means no matter what it is, you'll save it because you think you're going to need it, whether you ever need it or not, or have a use for it. I'm a pack rat. So let me tell you, the Lord put me out on the street for a reason. Because he knew I was a pack rat. Uh-oh, is right. I am going to tell you what I have found on the streets of Loganville. You're not going to believe all of this. I have literally collected these things because I'm a pack rat. And because I won't pass it by. Well... All right, first of all, I have, uh, I have found on the street pennies, nickels, dimes, 
quarters, a couple dollar coins, found dollar bill, five dollar bill, ten dollar bills. Uh, yeah, are you going to really shout? Now she said mercy at ten dollar bills. Now what are you going to say at a twenty? Keep walking. <laughs> uh, bingo, that's why I keep doing it. You never know what I'm going to find. Well, that's not all I found out there. I found paper clips. I find screws of all sorts and assortments. I find nails. I pick those up because I don't want my neighbors getting flat tires. Amen. And not only that, but I find pencils, pens. Okay. Let me see what some of the other things I found. I, I, you're, you're saying, oh, you, you found those kind? Yes, I have. Plus, on top of that, I found a valid credit card on, oh, oh good. Thankfully, I found, I found the person that owned it. Yes, I know. I, I know that's what you meant. I know that's what that's, I understand that. That's fine. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Man, I'm on silence. That's right. I'm on this. Okay. And... Uh, a, 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 a valid credit card. I found a government EBT card that was also valid. Never could find the individual, but I kept looking, what am I going to do with this thing? Because I'm certainly not going to try to use it. That's for sure. And I saw in there, if lost and is found, please destroy. I said, that's my answer. I destroyed it. Well, that isn't the only thing. I found wallets while I was out there. I, 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 I found, this is crazy, but I found a bottle of men's cologne that still had a third of it in there on the street. I started to pass it by, and I stopped and looked at it, and I still started to pass it by, and something said, if you don't pick it up and look at it, you're always going to wonder whether it was good or empty or what. And so I picked it up, and I shook it, and then found out it had about a third in there, and I said, well, it's not going to spray, and when I sprayed, it sprayed, took it home, used it. Men's cologne on the street. How did it get there? Don't ask me. I don't know. It was just there. I have found, um, I, I found uh, other things, golf balls, tennis balls on the street. I found toys. I, I have no idea who, whose it was or what it was. A year or so ago, I found, I found Christmas decorations on the street. No idea. You're all quiet on this. <laughs> but I did not mention to you the most important thing I ever found on the street. This thing, this item, has radically affected my life and change. Remember, I'm a pack rat. The moment of the truth. I have something in my hand. And this is what? street that radically changed everything about me. A rubber band. I, I just saw a sleeping nodding head just rear up and look at it. That's right. A rubber band 
changed my life. Amen. And in fact, this is this is not the rubber band, but in all all do right or what have you. I'm going to give your pastor this rubber band. Here you are, Brother Waldron, right off the streets of Waldronville. I know some of you are saying, you have lost your mind. <laughs> no, I haven't. Because let me tell you why a rubber band changed my life. Okay. I'm going to have to turn around and face this way so that you can get the idea. It was probably, uh, oh, I don't know, it, it was three or four years ago. I, I, I had not been walking long. But I kept finding rubber bands, you know, just like these. Okay. Okay. Amen. I keep finding rubber bands. I have no idea where they come from. But guess what? I'm a pack rat. I have a whole drawer in the kitchen full of rubber bands. Amen. Praise the name. Well, what can I say? Praise God. And they're just kind of, kind of like this. Amen. Just like that. Right off the streets of Loganville. But this is what happened. I was walking on the other side of the subdivision. It was in the morning. I'm walking and true to form, out of the corner of my eye, I see a rubber band. All right? I reached down to pick up the rubber band. And when I do, my corner of my eye sort of fell on a penny. There is a penny also. And when I saw the rubber band, I said, you know, reach down. Well, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Believe it or not, when I find a rubber band, I say thank you, Lord. Just like when I find a penny. Most of you wouldn't even bend over to pick up a penny. But I don't let the pennies go by. Because I'll never forget what my dad said years ago. If something cost a dollar and you only had 99 cents, a penny's worth a whole lot. Amen. And so I just keep on, you know. And then there's that penny. And I said, well, whoa, thank you, Lord. This is the way it was. Now get the position. I'm looking down now. And you're like me, standing this way, looking at this rubber band. And you see this penny. And this penny is at about the 2 o'clock hour. You know what that means? Kind of, do you see the clock? Like that clock? Where the 2 is on there, off an angle. And it was about 12 or 15 inches over toward the two o'clock hour. Picked it up, mind you, morning. I finished my walk that day. I'm out doing my walking the next day. This time, I'm almost finished. Almost finished. I can see my home. I'm almost done with my entire walking for the day. Walking along. Didn't find me. Walking along. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, this is the next day afternoon near my home, there is a rubber band. I bend over to pick it up. Thank you, Lord, you know, once again. And when I did, out of the corner of my eye, at the 2 o'clock angle, about 12 or 15 inches, are you getting that? Identical components, identical position, 
one on the other side of the subdivision the day before in the morning, and now this one on my side of the subdivision in the afternoon. I not only thank, I, before I ever picked it up off of the street, this is what I said. Lord, what are you trying to tell me? See, I could have picked it up and just told folks, that's, a, that's weird, that's strange, and gone on my way. But the Lord knew what he was doing. And he knew, he knew my reaction. And because of that, he put a physical thing that what's the chances and the possibilities of a rubber band and a penny being in two locations on two different days in the same position? What is the chances of that? And that's why I said, because all of a sudden, see, I never said, Lord, the day before, what are you trying to say to me? But when that happened that second time, that stopped me. I stood right in that street and said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? And he had a message for me. And this is the message he had for me. I have given you a physical sign because I've already given you promises. And I told you that if you would do certain things, I would do certain things. And so here down the line, a few months from that, I have given you a physical thing because I knew you would be out and you would pick up anything off the street. And so I used what you are prone to do in order to do it unusually and cause you then to say, what is it? And this is what the Lord said. He said this to me. I have shown you physically. I told you I would prove to you. I would do the things that I promised to you if you would do it. And don't doubt me in the least. Just go ahead and do it. And I am proven to you. I will fulfill what I said I will do in your life. If something like that, if something like that can happen to me, God is no respecter of persons. Why aren't you having a few experiences? Or you? I, I'm not trying to put hardship or anything on you. I'm not trying to be mean or ugly. Or you? Maybe you. How about you nod your head right here? Because if God, since he is no respecter of persons, will give me a promise, how is it that we don't listen enough to hear the promises of God are yea and amen, and we don't find ourselves listening to the voice of the Lord? Oh, Lord, you ought to have something unusual happening in Europe. You ask for the rubber band. Amen. You didn't know it. You probably made yourself a target. Now you've got a responsibility. Maybe God's trying to talk to you about some things. Maybe he's already talking to you about some things. Maybe you've been having some difficulties. Maybe, you, yeah, I think I'm on target. I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. I think I, I'm on target. Amen. And, and God has been trying to talk. And you've had some questions. And you wondered why and how. And so you just happened to ask for that rubber band that I'm showing around. But you see, there may be something more to that. Because maybe God has said, you were in this place. I was in this place. It is no accident we're in here together. God is trying to change lives in this house.